and welcome to our Tag One Team Talk on how to grow, support, and fund your open source project. We have a really special guest today, Marine Haberbecka, the founder of ProseMirror, CodeMirror, and Acorn. It is so exciting to see that open source is more popular than ever, but sustainability has always been a really big challenge for open source projects. You know, a few projects really get off the ground. A lot of those projects that do quickly fade into, you know, obscurity and are no longer maintained. But sometimes projects evolve into something amazing and sustainable. At Tag1, we're major contributors to open source projects, and so we wanted to do a series of talks with founders of popular open source projects to talk about how they got to sustainability. We want to encourage our listeners to do more to support the projects that they rely on, and we want to help founders of other open source projects foster and grow their projects and community. I'm Michael Myers, the Managing Director of Tag1 Consulting, and joining us today for the conversation with Marine is Kevin Jans, the founder of YJS, which is an open source framework that allows you to add collaboration to any application. And it's been used to add shared editing to both CodeMirror and ProseMirror, uh, as well as Fabian Franz, who is the Vice President of Technology at Tag1. And Fabian is the core maintainer and framework manager who oversees Drupal 7, which is the second most popular CMS after WordPress. It pop powers around 3% of the top 1 million websites. So there's a ton to cover today. We're going to do this in two segments. This is the first segment, which is going to be a brief background. And then we're going to talk a lot about growing a community of users and contributors. Please be sure to check out Funding Your Open Source Project, which is going to be part two. The link is in the description below. So, Lorraine, uh, just to set the stage for the conversation, you know, I'd be shocked if our listeners haven't heard of Prosmir. CodeMirror or Acorn, but it would be great, you know, in your own words, if you could just tell us a little bit about these projects. Right. Yeah, let's start with CodeMirror, which is the, the oldest one of the three. CodeMirror is a code editor component library that's browser JavaScript, so you can just use it to get like a kind of extended text area, which has some of the conveniences that you're used to in code editors. Acorn is a JavaScript parser, which is used by quite a few tools that transform or do something with, with JavaScript code. And ProseMirror is the newest of the three, is a structured text editor. So kind of like uh, what you see is what you get editor, but with a more rigorous approach to uh, the structure of the content. That's very modest. Acorn has, what, over 7 million users <laughs> used by a few applications. So yeah, it's mostly really just popular. like transitive dependency. A few big projects use it, so that yeah. produces a big user count in a way. <laughs> so my, my question is, how, how did you get into this? Why did you start these projects? For CodeMirror, I was actually solving my own problem. I have this textbook about JavaScript called Eloquent JavaScript, which has a, like an online version with an integrated kind of code sandbox where you can just play around with code as you're reading. And uh, yeah, coding in a text area is really, really uncomfortable. So when I wrote this in 2007, I tried to build something a little bit better and then it got a bit out of hand and led to the first version of uh, CodeMirror. Oh, that's fun. It's, it reminds me of the story of, story of LaTeX, where the author of LaTeX wanted to create a book, and he was like, I need to write a programming language first. What are some of the biggest challenges that you have as you know, the founder and maintainer of these projects and communities? I mean, it's a bunch of work, but it's, there's no real huge challenges that come to mind. It's, Mostly enjoyable. So, yeah. Where where does your time go then? It's a bunch of work. You know, how much time are you putting into these projects? You know, is is it mostly development, reviewing contributions? I'm working on these pretty much full time. I do a bit of consulting now and then, but it's mostly just work directly on the open source uh, code. 
I think for the past years, it's been about 50-50. Half of my time goes into just maintenance and communication. And the other half have been working on new stuff. I've been rewriting Code Mirror to be like more up to date with current realities. And that's been a huge project. So that's just been like new code and new design. That's yeah, you're, that's basically how you're it's talking, been divided. You're talking about Code Mirror 6, right? Which is your newest yeah. project. Uh, you want to talk a bit about that? Yeah, it's about three years since I started on that. Now it's like uh, Code Mirror 5 is 10 years old. Well, like that, that range of compatible interface 2 to 5, versions uh, 2.0 to 5, has been pretty much entirely backwards compatible for 10 years. And that means that it's really dated. And yeah, it was time to start just rethinking the system, which is then, of course, an uh, invitation for like really exaggerate over design and uh, second system syndrome kind of thing. So yeah, it's a very different system now, much more powerful, but also quite a bit more complex that I've, yeah, I've tried to kind of catch up with the capabilities of Monaco, the, the code editor in VS Code, address accessibility concerns, properly support touchscreen devices, and generally make the system designed quite a bit better so that extensions don't get in, in each other's way. And you can do like really ambitious stuff like collaborative editing without getting into weird corner cases that the library doesn't handle. So yeah, that's been my focus for the past years. Yeah, I just want to say like, I played around with Code Mirror 6 just recently, a few months back, and it's been a really good experience uh, compared to Code Mirror 5 or even compared to Ace Editor, which is what I was familiar with back then. And it has a really nice API and the plugin system. I can really imagine a huge ecosystem around uh, Code Mirror 6. It's really, really cool what you've built. Uh, so, what? Cool, that's great to hear. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. And I've, I'm working on uh, text editing and rich text editing all, on all your projects, basically. So, yeah, so I just want to congratulate you. But also, I want to know what, how did you get into that? Like, how did you start that? How do you start such a project? Because like, for me, when I start a project, I want to, I need to get funding or some income. Uh, you already have a big community and basically a lot of saying in this community. And do you communicate with companies or do you, are, are you asking publicly? So the thing that started the rewrite was that I heard about this prototype fund, which is an initiative from the German state where they just put 50,000 euros in a starting open source project, if you can sell it well enough. And I had been thinking about like modernizing code mirror, but indeed it's like, yeah, it was clear that it was a big project and that it would be tricky to get funding. And it was like a very, we could add buzzwords about accessibility and it was a pretty easy sell to, to get like many of these kind of foundations are a gigantic paperwork to, to get anything like it's almost not worth the time, but this one is, is really nice and that they try to actually make it like a pleasant experience for the people who get funded as well. So that was like, okay, we can, I was, I started the project together with Adrian Heine, who's my co-maintainer on Code Mirror, And yeah, we figured we can see, uh, like work on this for half a year and see uh, how far we get. And if it looks viable at that point, continue. So that's what we did and that worked out. and. Then we had enough to show to start a crowdfunder and got a bunch more money that way. At that point, Adrian dropped out, so I continued myself for a few years after that. But yeah, it was like at some point the funding kind of ran out, and I'm like now kind of hoping that this project is going to get successful enough to get like actual 
user funding, but that definitely covered most of the uh, development work. Could you think that your that your project could be like used in a huge code IDE, IDE like Visual, Visual Studio Code or something like that at one day? Yeah, I, there is brackets, Adobe's editor IDE thing, which is built on Code Mirror Five, but that never took up to, off to the extent that Atom or VS Code uh, did. But uh, yeah, I think feature-wise, Code Mirror Five already and definitely Code Mirror Six is, is powerful enough to build something like that on, and that is kind of like. In terms of determining the scope of the project, it's kind of awkward because it's used both by people who just want a fancy text area and people who are building an actual IDE. And yeah, it's definitely leaning more towards heavyweight, very intensive use cases than just getting syntax highlighting in your text area at this point. Can CodeMirror 6 also do things like IntelliSense, like the, the um, expansion of, of things? Do you have structure for that? Just curious. You mean uh, auto completion? Auto completion, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It has in, in, that built in. Uh, it doesn't like a request I get often is whether it can talk to a, a language server, what are they called? The thing that Microsoft invented for, for VS Code and is used by pretty much all editors now, but that's not available out of the box because it's quite awkward to like the protocol is designed for desktop use and doing that in a web page is raising a lot of new questions that I haven't really had the time to solve yet. <laughs> for sure. No, I was just curious. Is there a, a secret to getting end users, people to use this? Have you noticed a catalyst or a common thread across your projects? So I think originally with Code Mirror, it was there was nothing else really in this space. There were a few projects, but they were pretty bad compared to Code Mirror. So it was like a new thing that you could suddenly do, and that of course, like it was a slow uptake, but it was like a steady uptake because it was many people needed this thing, and in the end, a lot of them ended up finding Code Mirror. Later, there were some competitors, but then it was already like a household name. And I think that that contributed to people keeping, keep picking Code Mirror even when Ace and Spater, uh, later Monaco uh, existed. And I think my other projects is, is kind of like a name recognition thing. Like I was already pretty known in the community because of Code Mirror and Eloquent JavaScript. And yeah, if you see three projects and one of them has an author behind them that you know, I would definitely also pick the one that where I know that they've developed something solid before. So it's probably a safer bet. And I think that contributed a lot to people choosing, for example, Acorn over S Prima, which is exactly as good a JavaScript parser as Acorn is. Uh, like JavaScript parsers are kind of a commodity at this point. There's a bunch of them and they're all good. So yeah, people picking Acorn is, I think, just, oh, we've heard that before, so let's go with that one. Or Prozmo for that case. You have also choose Prozmo because you had this this nice track record with, uh, with CodeMirror already, so we knew there was, was something behind it, etc. In our case with YJS, so there wasn't that much choice, but it's great. How do you feel when big companies like Atlassian use your Prozmo like in their products and uh, you know that everyone that's using Confluence essentially is using a part of your software. Yeah, that's neat. So also a bit terrifying because I'm never entirely convinced that it is going to work at that scale. Every time I am in touch with them, I ask like if it's still no major project problems and they keep saying, no, no, it works. So it's, it's <laughs> always a surprise, but yeah, it's cool, especially since I don't have any strict legal requirements to be responsible if something goes wrong. So there's a, like, <laughs> it's a different relation to be an open source provider than to be a commercial software provider, like a bit less stressful in that way. 
I can do it just as a one person company without uh, lots of stress and lawyers. So uh, that's also kind of nice. And, and yeah, Atlassian does fund development. So th this is uh, definitely a satisfactory situation. What about growing your contributor base? Uh, you know, do you have a lot of contributors to these projects? Is it, you know, mostly driven by you or a few people? My projects are definitely very focused on me. I've never been good at like fostering a big community of contributors. Like CodeMirror, of course, has lots of contributors, but they're mostly like drive by, uh, provided a small fix or added the language mode. And I'm very protective of my code and like working with me doing some like tricky change to the core is not always easy, I think. And also like, that's also a good thing because yeah, you see some projects just take on more and more complexity and at some points they're a mess. And yeah, I'm definitely a control freak who tries to keep everything like in a scope and a style that I can deal with. A while ago, there was this thing going around the internet of some project that's explicitly declared like this is open source, but it's not open contribution. I'm not taking any PRs and I'm not going quite that far, but there are definitely people with which I can work together, even on, on like complicated, tricky things, but that's rare. And I like reviewing complicated scary changes from strangers who probably don't have the understanding of the system that I have is, is like really tiring and not something I enjoy. Like I'll often end up rewriting their stuff, which is extremely demotivating for them. But sometimes the only way I can get a feature in a shape where I actually believe that it's solid. So I'm not really someone to look for advice on how to build a contributor base for, because yeah, I don't really have a lot of long-term serious contributors to my projects. And I find that really, really interesting. There's so many ways in, in building open source projects. Some are like thriving only with a contributor base and you're like, like managing it more yourself. So what could one say that you would prefer a feature request to a pull request in that case, because you can probably e easier work with a feature request than when you got all this code written already. Yeah. Yeah. Usually like big patches out of the blue that aren't like, weren't discussed at all. Yeah. That I don't have a very positive reaction to that. Sometimes it is possible to just work out a design and an issue and then the person who wants it actually puts together a, a proper pull request. That also happens, but yeah, usually it's less work for me to implement something than to review code and communicate and get things to a point where I like it. So Ryan, a big problem that we've seen and, and even experience ourselves and, you know, a lot of people on our team is that when you become a major contributor to open source, burnout sets in, you know, over time you're working so hard. Is that something that, that you've dealt with and have, you know, how do you manage that? Yeah, definitely. There have been a bunch of points where I was not in a good relation with my projects because they just stressed me. and. I've learned to deal with it better to a certain extent. Like every time I just dropped a bunch of responsibilities, like they felt like too much and I just stopped doing something or just completely stopped maintaining a project. It's always been really liberating. And yeah, that's, that happened a few times. Like Turin was a relatively big project, which is like, JavaScript's code analysis engine providing like some IDE features for an annotated JavaScript, like not something that TypeScript is doing now for uh, how people develop uh, JavaScript. 
that was a pretty cool project when it was first built, but it was kind of implemented in a messy way. And at some point it just felt like terrible unrewarding work to keep handling issues for that. And I just stopped maintaining it. And that wasn't that bad. Like in the end, it's great that TypeScript replaces it and things move on. Also, just being really clear uh, to yourself, like what, what you're going to do and what you're not going to do is something I've gotten better at because if you take every request from every user seriously, it can get really, really stressful, but you don't have to like, I've accepted that it's perfectly okay to leave issues from people who aren't explicitly paying me to work on this just sitting for months because I don't have time. It's like that happens and it's, yeah, that used to stress me out terribly, but it's, yeah, I've come to accept that as part of this workflow. So you essentially have learned to say no to things. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I and know, even I... to just decide, okay, I'm not going to do this and write back saying, okay, this is not going to happen. Don't wait for it. That's yeah. It Usually, at, at least people know what they're what they're what they can expect and uh, can also move on. Yeah, and I mean, anyone could still uh, decide to pay you for the work. So, right, yeah. I think learning how to say no is something that everybody struggles with. You know, as a consulting company, you know, saying no to new business when it's just not good for us. You know, or not a fit for us. You know, at first that was really hard. And then you learn that it's better for everybody. So that's interesting. What are the biggest barriers that you or your projects face right now? I think the fact that I don't scale infinitely is definitely a thing. I felt that, for example, the rewrite of Code Mirror dragged on too long. But yeah, as someone working on their own, that's just the reality. Like if you have this ambitious scope is going to take a lot of time. So I'm trying to explicitly design the scope of my projects so that I can actually handle them without stressing out. For example, by just saying no to certain things and making it so that they're modular enough that I can tell people, yeah, that's a good idea. You can implement it in your own extension and maintain it yourself. It's not going to be in my core library. Yeah, this is something I noticed that uh, you're pretty big on plugins, <laughs> like creating plugin systems and ensuring everything is pluggable. That coming from a Drupal standpoint is also one of the things that made it great that essentially we have we had lots of contributed modules where you could plug in into almost every part of the system. And yeah, I think that's definitely one way to offload like work, give people interfaces to interface with you and then let them do whatever they need to do. Right. It definitely has a cost in terms of complexity that less sophisticated users have to deal with, which is not great. But yeah, I've decided to go that way both because it allows really, really ambitious, interesting extensions. And because, yeah, it means I can spread out maintenance burden a bit to, uh, other projects. You, you just said that you don't scale infinitely and that's like really well put, I feel. How would you like to solve that? Or do you want to solve that at all? Would you like to get more help from different people, companies or? So for the longest time, I did think that, yeah, if I could just find some really cool co-maintainers to work with, that would be the way forward. But I've kind of learned about myself that I'm not really very good at cooperating, which is probably exactly the reason why I ended up doing what I'm doing. I'm a, an enormous just pathological control freak, and I really like this feeling of just having the project entirely created in my image the way I like it. And I really like, I worked on, on the Rust compiler in a big team, for example, at Mozilla for a year. 
And that was really interesting, but also so stressful for me to have all these decisions that some of them I didn't agree with made in the project. And then I just had to live with them. And that's, yeah, every healthy developer that works in a team learns to deal with that, but I never really did. So I just built my own sand castles, basically. Fortunately, you did not invent a Linux kernel. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Linux also has this kind of dictatorial style stuff. Right, like he's personally offended if someone <laughs> wants to do something differently. Yeah, yeah. I... <laughs> it's still, but I mean, it had Get a bit of that. I, I try to be more diplomatic about it, but... Um... <laughs> <laughs> I think it's... It's important that there's different bleeding styles for open source projects again, and also that um, for Linux, this um, system of having people he really, really, really could trust in the end worked out, but it took also years. And obviously, a kernel is on a, on a also on a little bit different scale than still. Especially. Yeah, you. Could not maintain a Linux kernel by yourself. That's. <laughs> I mean, but you but can maintain a great editor by yourself, as we have seen. <laughs> I guess it's a bit less complex, but still a pretty huge topic. I feel uh, like writing an editor. There are a lot of opinionated people who like tell you how complicated it is, and I just scratched the surface, and it's 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 really touching a lot of different things. But for me, this answers like a really cool question. I feel. If prose mirror and code mirror would have been written by a community, for me, it would have been really hard to get started. Like for me, I, I started using code mirror six and I was able to be productive in three days because I basically knew the plugin system from prose mirror. It's like a really opinionated way to do something and it works very similarly. And that's something I really appreciate. And I have some experience with prose mirror. So I was able to write plugins for code mirror six and so that's, I guess, the advantage of having some authoritative dictator over this code who tells you this is the way how we do things. And there are not seven different interfaces for the same thing. That happens a lot in open source projects, I feel. Right, yeah. I try to kind of protect people from themselves in my interfaces and in that I make it really hard to do things wrong. Because in a real-time thing like an editor, it's really easy to just make things terribly inefficient or break interaction with other plugins. But yeah, I don't think the group of people who are writing both against Prose Mirror and Code Mirror is that big. So yeah, that might need not be a super relevant property of the systems. Before we uh, wrap up, Marijn, is there anything that you'd like to promote or ask of our listeners, a way that they can support you or your projects? I'm trying to build my like financial product support on, on, on like companies, not individual hobbyists or enthusiasts, because I think they have more money and they're they're the ones who should be paying if they're making a profit. But if you work at a company that is using my software, yeah, prodding the right people to set up a contribution would be a, a really helpful thing. Awesome. I, I agree. I think contributions should come from companies, not individuals that are building open source. It just perpetuates the problem. Wonderful to see people, you know, support and Many of us as consultants do make money, and, and you know it makes sense in some cases to do so. But, Ryan, thank you so much for, for joining us. To our listeners, you know, make sure that you check out a segment two, funding your open source project. Links we mentioned are going to be posted in the description. If you like this talk, please remember to upvote, subscribe, and share it. You can check out past Tag1 Team Talks at tag1.com slash talks. As always, we'd love to hear from you, suggestions on topics or any feedback on the topics we've covered. You can email us at tagteamtalks at tagone.com. A huge thank you to all of you for participating today, and thank you to all our listeners for joining us. Take care.